Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, so once again, guys, nice to have you here. Um, if you weren't here when you first walked in, my name is Travis Morin. I'm the Communications Manager for Charles River Watershed Association. And you're joining us for the Charles River Navigation Project, uh, kind of cooperation between us and Cameron Salvatore himself, the guy who made the journey, who made it all happen. Um, we think you're gonna like this. This is kind of a different kind of presentation than we usually have. This is a bit more of a narrative. We're gonna be exploring kind of parts of the Charles that most folks don't usually see um, from Ken's perspective, from, from the boat itself in many places. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna kick it over to Cam and uh, yeah, we'll begin the presentation. So take it away, Cam. Hi, hi everybody. I'm Cam Salvatore um, and thank you all for coming. First and foremost, um, happy to do this with y'all with, um, with the help of Charles River Watershed Association. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I was born in Massachusetts. I went to the school, uh, I went to school at Tufts, School of Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and since then I'd lived in New York City and a little bit in Los Angeles and finally returned a few years ago and then now live in Watertown, Mass. Um, actually, um, kind of have to, pardon me for a moment. I just got to... Um, There you go. All right. Um, and now I live in Watertown. Um, so some of my childhood, I spent canoeing and fishing on the Charles River. And I, I consider some of those stretches like home. Um, it was only just recently I picked up paddling as a pastime. Formerly, I kind of leaned more into backcountry hiking and scrambling as my means of casual adventuring. But when I returned to Watertown and was reintroduced to the Charles River, it's kind of when the idea of this navigation project came to fruition. So the navigation project in its entirety kind of encapsulated is, uh, it's, the first, um, it's the first recorded single vessel, unsupported, continuous solo passage of the full length of the Charles River. Um, and so Essentially what that means is um, it's just one boat. I'm not switching boats. Um, it means that I didn't get any help along the way. It means um, I didn't use a motorboat or a kite or anything like that or a sail. It means I did it from front to back on the river itself, um, never kind of stopping at a hotel or getting off the river, going home, having a nice nap and coming back to the river. Um, and I mean, and solo is I just did it alone. Um, and the full length of the Charles River from top to the bottom. So. Um, you can ask your friends and family, where does the Charles River end up? And like, where does it finish? And the majority of Bostonians or folks who have visited the city or for a museum or a baseball game would know it runs right between Boston and Cambridge. It's filled with sailboats and pleasure vessels, and it goes straight to the Atlantic Ocean, right? Um, it's the same river. It's a historic river, American River. Um, it hosted the American Revolution was on it. Um, it hosted a lot of the um, major factories and forces of the Industrial Revolution in America. So it's a big, like classic American river. Um, now, people usually know if they've even seen a postcard of the Charles River, um, where it ends up. But um, a lot of people, you know, you ask the same folks, they don't really know where it comes from. You'll stump them if you ask them where it starts. Even lifelong Massachusetts residents it won't know 80 meandering river miles away in Hopkinton is the source. I, on the project, as I portaged the early passes near Echo Lake in Hopkinton, the source, I pulled my kayak past a cyclist and asked them, do you know where the Charles River is? And they said, Boston. Um, you know, not aware that the green kind of not so healthy flow of water that we stood over was in fact the one and only. The one and only. So let's think about that. It, it's not just a quantifier or a qualifier, the one and only, but I'll get back to that. Um, the navigation project was not my first attempt I had made to complete the Charles River in one go. So um, back in early spring of 2013, I took my parents' poly canoe and started at Norfolk's Populatic Pond, which was before now was considered the start point of a meaningfully navigable Charles River. 
so I packed a large cooler full of lunch meat and far too many supplies in a non-waterproof bag. I waved goodbye to my dad who was shaking his head driving away and I set off. I made it about 20 minutes to the rapid at Pleasant and Dean Street um, where because of the weight and the size of the canoe that I was in, I was just one person in a canoe, not to mention a severe pilot error on my part. I collided head on with the bridge support pylon and the spring water flow kind of <laughs> swung me sideways. And when I shifted down to the side, I began taking on water, like a lot of water. The canoe fully dipped sideways and I just bailed out of the canoe. Um, the cooler with all my food tumbled out and went its merry way down river. I snagged my pack. It was the only thing I could grab. And I waded in the shoulder high water to the edge of the river. Now, I tracked the cooler and backup paddle and saw where I may boat down to go pick them up, but I turned to collect the canoe. And by then it was too late. The flow of the water filling that canoe had completely folded the boat in half around the pylon. It looked like I hit it at 65 miles an hour. The trip was over, right? To make it worse, my phone, I was smart enough to pack my phone keenly into the cooler with the baloney. So some very kind Sunday driver got flagged down by me soaking wet, trying to use their cell phone to call my dad who was just arriving home when he got the call to return to Norfolk to collect this disaster. Um, yeah, it, it was bad, <laughs> but it could have been a lot worse. You know, as I watched my tent dip below water, Pinned between that pylon and the plastic boat, I realized I'd gotten out easy. So now it's flashed to last summer, right? Um, travel was canceled and pretty much nothing is going according to plan. Since 2013, I had racked up about thousands of hours of backcountry and travel experience due to my love for it and when I'm lucky enough to be hired for it. Uh, this work is comprised of plenty of photography and video from wild places around the world. It includes a documentary I'm proud to be taking part of. It's in the making. It brought me to the Siberian swamp where I lived in a tent for five weeks on a flag expedition, helping film the archaeological study of, these, of a Bronze Age necropolis. Really, really neat stuff, but very long time to be in the swamp. Um, so not being able to leave the state safely now, right, um, in 2020, like other folks not predisposed to sitting still, I was beginning to wilt. The memory of my failed trip at this time, now living in Watertown, just kind of bubbled up to the surface. And I believe with the experience I had gained, I was able to take it on. So I used what I learned from my friends on expedition. And I did the research first and tried to get a clear picture of what I was in for before just setting off with a cooler full of baloney. Um, my research initially led me to the lovely folks at the Charles River Watershed Association. They uh, provided the most up-to-date conditions of the river and some of the challenges that I would be facing, namely in August, severe drought and extremely low water due to the drought, but also to invasive flora, not to mention cyanobacteria. When I decided to take this trip, there was a six month bloom of cyanobacteria or it had lasted, the warning would drop from, it was mid June to I think mid December. Um, until the flag went down. So um, it was an issue and they were just, they're knowledgeable enough that they would let me know and gave me all that information as I was going so I could be careful and safe on my trip. Um, so they also provided something really important. They provided a map, right? Um, <laughs> so that, as well as some other resources they kind of pointed me to, which were fantastic resources. It's the blog for one of Doug Cornelius, as well as written work on the Charles River by Ron McAdow. And for anyone who's interested, those two resources, along with the current conditions provided by the experts at Charles River Watershed Association, as well, also, I can't forget the folks that are at Paddle Boston. They were a huge help in, in describing conditions for me. Um, they provide a detailed picture of the recreational river, as well as like historic context, beautiful descriptive images and illustrations. 
really all of them together, they're, they're must go to and must read resources for someone who's interested in the river from source to sea or just in sections. So in these resources and research bubbled up another question as I'm, or situation as I'm reading, I'm realizing that nobody has recorded the continuous passage of the Charles River. So as a disclaimer, Native people have lived along the river for thousands of years, even before European civilization arrived. So it's probable it's been done before. Extremely probable, very probable. Um, but the project that was taking shape in my mind could set a tangible piece in history that could be referenced for future paddlers and enthusiasts along the way. So on top of my desire to write an old failure, there was this new challenge. So let's get on with it, right? I set off on a preliminary run with all this research. I enlisted my friend and experienced down for anything kind of guy, Stephen Lansing, to join me on this attempt. He's also an adjunct professor at the Tufts Medical School for physician assistants. So I felt like a little bit more comfortable paddling around those bigger waterfalls. Um, together, we approached the river as if we were going source to sea. Um, we first tackled area zero the 10 river miles between the source at Echo Lake to the Populatic Pond in Norfolk. This stretch of the Charles River is the portion that's deemed not meaningfully navigable. And um, we've got a couple of pictures to show how it went. Here you can see um, some pretty crummy water, um, very, very, very low water at the time. Um, and I think also there is a, a short video of a couple bits of me and, and Steve Lansing getting along on this trip. So I'm having a bit of trouble hearing it. Can, can anybody hear that video? So essentially I'm describing here, this is the very bottom of the, um, Echo Lake Dam and just past it, this is 100 Deer Path Road. Um, just that direction is Wildcat Dam. Um, and you can see as I'm referencing down, there's about, there's less than four inches of water there. Um, essentially, it just kind of covers up my toes as I was going on. So Steve and I are trying to pull these kayaks through this area. You know, look, at this does not look like the Charles River of, um, you know, Bellingham Meadows or the lakes district or anything like that. It's essentially a small running creek. Um, and yeah, so I'm trying to, at this moment, I think just describe how, um, how low the water flow is. Um, that is the dam that we had had to drop our kayaks down. Um, and it, there's just zero water flow running down it. Um, I think Steve's up under that bridge somewhere under a hundred deer path. Um, here is, um, I want to say is the Medway Dam, West Medway Dam. Um, one of the many portages that you kind of have to drag your uh, kayak over as we're going along. Um, some places are a little bit better than others. You can kind of drag your, again, there's enough to float your kayak, but not sit in it as you're going down this, um, this portion of the river. Um, so Easier to pull, there's Steve there, um, making his way ahead. This portion right here is the is um, Medford Pond. So um, this was by far the most challenging bit of area zero. You can see the amount of mud that's there, um, almost no water. The consistency is kind of like walking through frosting. Um, and it is extremely challenging to get through. We were seriously inching along and um, finally, we were able to get to um, a little bit more water flow um, very, very, very briefly. And it kind of continues like this. You know, you go from um, barely paddleable water to um, pretty much absolutely nothing at all. There are hundreds, there I am, there's hundreds of, <laughs> of obstructions that are kind of blocking the way. You have to take your kayak out so many times to drag them over. I think in, in the later bit, um, you'll see some of the obstructions I'm describing. But eventually you do get to paddleable water and it becomes a little bit more of a smooth ride. That's just a small aspect of this preliminary trip that we had taken um, that, you know, we, you know, 
the boat was at its heaviest due to all the supplies needed we needed along the way and you know it was it, that bit that area zero is easily the most difficult part of that navigation and we did it for two days and we didn't make it to the populatic pond so the majority of that trip is really pulling that kayak through that area um so it was hard very hard like like I showed you non-existent water levels, over hundred obstacles and obstructions. We retrace steps for safety precautions several times. There's a tunnel that leads under route 16. And when you're at it, you can't see the light through it. So at that point, we're not sure whether to go um, or portage at this moment, or whether water levels are gonna get high enough at certain locations. For instance, I know um, somebody who recently attempted um, and completed the trek went to go under the 495 bridge and from one side they could see light through it but the bridge is kind of altered and tilted um so when they tried to get through it went from having about a foot of clearance to having inches of clearance on the opposite side so those little snafus are all those things that we were kind of looking for um so it was a learning experience, um, but it was enough to build a stronger criteria for this general challenge. And moreover, during this experience, I had a stark realization. Uh, the river that I saw up there was not at all the river that I saw as a kid around Red Wing Bay and not nearly the one I see in Boston that touts a great success story of rehabilitation over the last 30 years. Um, this upper part of the river needs some attention and it's relatively invisible. So. I reapproached Charles River Watershed Association and Paddle Boston for help um, setting up a safe time and controlled criteria for this source to sea passage. Um, and when setting the date, Mark from Paddle Boston um, threw me a literal and metaphorical flotation device with some safety tips. Um, he put forward a um, very useful uh, water flow data resource, which allowed me to identify what window of time I was able to take on this challenge and that the time I was, um, because of my schedule, able to take on that challenge, it was precisely the lowest water levels possible. So for some context, August of 2020, Massachusetts EEA secretary extended the level two significant drought to include all regions across the Commonwealth. The drought was, I mean, you remember 2020, it was above average temperatures for more than three months and more than three months of below average rainfall. So luckily, um, I caught a pair of rainy days to give me a little bit of a speed boost, um, a small upward notch in the downhill that was August of an already downhill 2020. So I set off and it looked a little bit like this. Um, so for this video, I'm hoping we can get some sound for it. Um, if I need to share it on my end, I could, I could probably share screen. Um, let me just pull it up. I think we just needed to uh, make a few. So try to, when you share the screen, you just need to enhance the sound. I think we got a cam. Okay. <laughs> Good old technology. I know we've yes. been using Zoom for. Yeah, for every Zoom call, there is finally doing something. Oh, here I am. No, let it let, been let to do for up. a while. Full run on Charles River, source to sea. Um, hasn't been recorded as time yet, so I'm going to be the first, but the reason people don't do it and don't do it in summertime is because of this is what the beginning looks like. It's not pretty. Pretty much, uh, sloshing through some pretty deep muck. It's pretty smelly. So as I trudge through this, um, little bit in Hopkinton, um, I just uh, wanted to answer some of the questions that I got like immediately, most of which was why. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've been thinking about doing this for a very long time. There's a story involved, but I'll get to that later um, when it's a little less treacherous. <laughs> um, but uh, I started working with very nice folks over at the Charles River Watershed Association and Paddle Boston to try to put this together. Um, you know, to learn more about the river and like this bit, who's seen this bit of the Charles River? You know, um, not a whole lot of people bother to get in here. 
and um, you know it's worth showing. Kind of wanted to know more about the river, um, know more about like the pollution in the river. You can see a nice little tire in there. You do a little, uh, you know, age analysis on that maybe, and see when that thing arrived into the river, or at least uh, you know ballpark. But um, and to learn more about myself, you know get into some hard spots and try to figure out my way out. Hopefully not too hard. Um, stay tuned for more. More pretty stuff, hopefully. All right, right now we're on the other side of Wildcat. Um, you can see the street right there. That's a 100 deer path off of 85. Um, and now we're dropped down a steep little dam right over there for portage and then came into this stuff. And let me tell you about this stuff. It's a... Uh, the most, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, it's the Siberian stuff, you know, real boot sticking mud. You, know, you go straight into this stuff and you don't come out. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to get a little bit on the dry ground here or else I'm gonna be real slow. <laughs> oh boy. All right. <laughs> how kind of crappy it gets as far as pollution goes, water levels. You can see the marker up there. Um, and I don't know, it doesn't really do much. There's only about that much water, you know? So here we are. Any trolls down there? No. Milford Pond, it's by far the hardest um, bit that I've had to go through. And I'm in it right now. Um, it's this right here. So you can see right next to me, it's like some pretty good looking, good looking mud. And I found a little pathway to get through. See how little water there is right there? I mean, this stuff is that boot sticking mud. You go, you go pretty deep in there. Um, but I figured out a way. It's just enough water, not to paddle, but for all of you skiers out there, you might appreciate this. You know, you just get a little scoot going. Both paddles on either side. You can make a little headway. Whew, still got a ways to go though. So after all that junk, finally made it to um, some open water at Milford Pond. It's really tricky this bet. Um, and I waited for some rain to help me out a little bit and I just barely did only because you know the flow just showed me the right way to go and that little bit of water it's just inches maybe an inch you know that shows me the right way to go um, you know maximize my effort and it pays off because I'm a little bit ahead of schedule just going with the flow of a downer but um you know, on this stretch, it's really hard to, um, you know, get over the quality of the water here. It's got this tinge to it, lots of trash. And, you know, it's, it's crazy to see all this stuff just kind of washed up um, from, you know, some of it's old, some of it's brand new, you know? Um, and if, I don't know, the time that I've spent with archeologists has told me like people will find this stuff and it's going to, you know, reflect on our culture accordingly. Um, you know, this is stuff that's here and has been here for a long time. For instance, see what I got there? That looks like it's been here for a while. Anyhow, if you can get over that bit, um, and we will shortly, They'll, we'll be getting down to the spots where they have been actively cleaned and they have been, you know, very well taken care of thanks to people who care. Um, and um, it will end up looking better, but this part in particular is just kind of overlooked as a, um, as a piece of the same river. So, yeah. All right, so this is the Route 16 tunnel. Um, I came all the way through to the end here and um, 
yeah, pretty, pretty creepy. And um, what makes it even worse is that it's a really great habitat for spiders. Um, they're uh, pretty much all over here. Wait, wait, you'll see this. So those orb weavers, they're just lying in the walls. Those are all spiders. Yep, look at that guy. Woo! Not an arachnophobe's uh, best or favorite place, this tunnel. Look at all of them. They line every 10 inches the walls. It's a bit of a downer, but just after the two tunnels, the quality of water um, just kind of sharply drops. Um, it's got a um, tinge to it and lots of trash. Um, Thought I'd just take another second before uh, hitting another rough patch to show you guys this bit. I'll be coming up on Bellingham Meadows pretty soon. Really, really pretty stretch of the Charles. So some of my stuff's not uploading because of the service out here, but uh, I wanted to show you this. Um, this is Bellingham Meadows. So you can see a little trickle of water through here. It's just enough to get me through. Maybe doing that skiing technique. But um, yeah, pretty soon that the grass is gonna be taller than me and that's, you know, not that tall. But um, it's gonna be tricky to navigate through. And uh, you know, trying to get to my, my ideal spot to camp for the night. Good morning. After some pretty horrendous sleep and uh, a lot of mosquito bites, I'll be starting my next run in the Charles. It's a series of dams that run through Bellingham um, and Medway, and um, they can be pretty, pretty challenging. So I'm gonna be paddling my little heart out. Hopefully I can give you some posts on the way. Let's go. Just got through a good bit of paddling. Finally got to put both of them together, get through uh, the Bellingham Meadows. Um, really beautiful stretch. Um, pretty much chasing great blue herons the whole way through. Um, really twisting and turning, just like the uh, old namesake of the Charles River, Quinobi Quinn. And um, finally getting through to this next bit, which probably has some more obstructions. But first, you can hear that noise in the background, that's the 495 again. So this time it's got a little tunnel I can paddle under, so I'll show you that in just a moment. Yeah, here we go. Um, that's the 495 up there, um, and the end of the tunnel is right through there. You can see the uh, date on most of the tunnels here. Any trolls down here? No, nope. just me. Thanks, Bellingham. It's been real. I'm just here at the dam right now, doing my portage, and I thought I'd stop and dry off a little bit and get some weight off the boat and into my belly. Next up is the carry boat. We're going through some uh, pretty shallow, rocky stuff. Um, I've made it to the old Carryville Dam. And this place, I believe, got torn down in 2016. Um, and this is what's left. So this is a pretty classic obstruction that I've been going through all day today. Um, there's like, nearly nearly a hundred something not this big or anything but um you know times where you have to get out of the boat pull the boat over the thing and then um you know put it back in on the other side what's different about this one is that somebody left the boat here here's another picture perfect set of obstructions um no way under these guys, so we're going over and lifting this boat over and over again takes a toll. That's why the first two days of this endeavor are the trickiest. But man, it's real pretty out here, isn't it? For last big portage of the day, the Midway Dam just finished up. Smooth sailing after this, maybe? Made it to Lake Populatic in Norfolk. Beautiful place. Um, 
usually this is where people would start um, if they're trying to do the majority of the river. Uh, the next bit is especially nice. Um, two paddles all the way. Good morning. So as I'm making some headway on a different stretch of the river here, it actually kind of looks more like a river. I could put my paddles together, maybe get some speed. Um, before it wasn't so easy going, and a lot of that's because of the drought situation that we have in Massachusetts. Um, I say as the sun just starts peeking through and blaring down at me. Um, but um, a lot of the past two days has been very low water, if any water at all. And um, a lot of the areas that are supposed to have high water, like um, Populatic Pond and also Box Pond, um, it's filled with vegetation, um, essentially filling in some spots and slowing my progress to a crawl. Um, this kind of happens for a lot of reasons. Um, one of which is the runoff from people using their, you know, filling their pools, watering their lawns. Um, it'll run off the lawns and into the watershed, bringing a lot of nutrients, which act as fertilizer. So this fertilizer creates these um, big blooms in the areas where usually there wouldn't be something like that. And also it just creates a general competition for the resources of the river. And, um, you know, it can also lead to some other more nefarious stuff like the cyanobacteria. Uh, I haven't run into any of that yet, but um, I'm told that it's pretty much likely that I will. Um, in any case, paddle on. Coming up on this bridge, I just wanted to show you how much swallow activity is going on. I love these birds. They're so cool and fun to watch. I'm not going to stay too long. I don't want to bother them, but... For me as I just back paddle here, I'm uh, approaching... Well, I think I'm in Dover at this point, um, and... This is the most likely place to see river otters, <laughs> and I'm really hoping I see one. But um, if you keep your eye out on this low brush here on the side, you can see a small game path, probably from an otter. It's right there. Where are you guys going? Florida? Cancun? Can I come? Just before the South Natick Dam, Look at that beauty of a bridge. Isn't that something pretty? Oh, good one! 36.8 to go. Let's do it. Woo! Oh yeah. Oh boy, uh oh. This uh, past stretch of the Charles is a particular favorite because I grew up around here and I know it the best. Um, this little spot behind me it's one of my favorites, Rope Swing. Um, it has snapped on me before, <laughs> um, so I'm not gonna give it a shot right now, but I will be back. That leads me to say, um, you know, I'm most familiar with this bit, but for all the other ones, I relied heavily on uh, resources, um, much from the maps given by the Charles River Watershed Association, also by um, the partners with Paddle Boston. They're fantastic resources for anybody that wants to get on the river. And it's a beautiful Saturday to do it. You should be doing it. Go for it, man. Woo! Oh, yeah. 9.5. 9.5? Yeah. Ah, not quite a 10. <laughs> Hey friends, what's up? Yeah, I'm just passing by. Hey friends. Oh man, that little one's so cute. Oh, later. Oh man, I didn't see him at first. Look at that little guy. Look at him move. Good morning, 20 miles to go. Um, I'm doing a different stretch of the Charles today. Uh, it'll be Newton and uh, Lakes District, followed by the Lower Basin. And um, really trying to get through all these big dams today. Got a couple challenging portages to do, but um, paddling my wee little heart out the whole way. Ideally, I'd like to finish tonight, but I don't know if that's gonna happen. 
Um, I'll keep you posted as I go though. Paddle on. Man, this one was not easy. Horseshoe Dam. Um, rather than crossing Route 9, that's Route 9 right there. Um, I had to bring it right on down this steep slope behind me. A good, uh, good 30 feet of like pretty, pretty decent vert. So, but I'm in the water. Let's go. So through this section here, um, you can see a whole bunch of vegetation kind of slowing me down. But um, this area, Newton, as well as moving into the Lakes District, um, this is where the Charles River Watershed Association has their summer volunteer programs where they uh, remove some of the invasive vegetation in the area. Um, a lot of it's water chestnuts and they, uh, they removed 8.7 tons of water chestnuts from the river. Um, wow. And now the program's on hold because of the cyanobacteria issue that's in the Lakes District at the moment but um, I assume they'll be back on it as soon as they're able. Um, those are great folks over there. But in the meantime, um, paddling through this stuff, um, you can hear 95 on my left here. Yeah, I can even see signs. I don't know if you can, uh, I can see the signs on the, uh, on the highway there. 10 o'clock on another beautiful day. Um, ton of people in the river today. It's really great to see. I got my folks there at uh, Paddle Boston hanging out they were telling me that um, there's just been an explosion of interest in getting kayaks and paddle boards out on the Charles because of the stuff that's happening um, it's an easy place to kind of get out and do some social stuff that's outdoors and it's just a beautiful time to do it um, it's gonna be great all the way up and through fall so um, try to get out there and do it um, if you can do it responsibly excuse me guys um, do you know which way it is to Boston? Can you tell me? Excuse me. About halfway through section 9 of the map, um, out of 10, I can see the little Prudential right there, which means I'm close, so close. I think I'll probably be around 5, 6 o'clock, um, but I'm not sure yet. So once I get into that last section, I'll have a good idea of how long I'm going to be. I'll keep you posted. So behind me is the... Um, the Herder Park launch and that means I'm in the final section section 10 of the Charles River and I've got five miles to go so definitely going to be completing this today um, I think between five and six o'clock I'll be getting through the locks and then I will um, come back through to up the Charles River again um, and stop at the Esplanade and um, rest my tired arms so I'll be in touch in in between then and now thanks for following too see you so this view is a little bit different than the rest of the stuff. Um, I'm uh, in Boston proper now. Hey, so um, pending I get through the locks okay um, and everything goes off without a hitch, from here I'll be posting all the criteria for this feat and making sure that it's available for anybody else that wants to try it. Uh, I'm sure that come high water there's going to be some faster times clocked, um, mine included. So. I did want to say, if anybody does want to make an attempt like this, um, feel free to reach out, um, ask me any questions you want to ask, and um, also I would encourage you to do it, not just for yourself, but to try to bring a greater awareness to the upper parts of the river while you do it. This kind of stuff, everybody sees, and it's a great success story, but um, we really need to get some attention to the more invisible parts of the river. That's part of the reason why I did it, and I hope it lives on. All right, something unexpected. Um, the locks are closed until next week. So I'm gonna pull the boat out of the water and I'm gonna just dip it in on the opposite side and I'm gonna have to portage. So um, I'll hopefully find a way pretty quick. And I'll let you know how it goes. So I found a way um, from the locks, which are right behind me there. I just kind of crawled up a dock here. And then I'm gonna put in, there it is, it's the Boston Harbor. Oh, it'll be so good. When there's a will, there's a way. Let's do it, let's go. Do you smell that salt water? 
Oh yeah, baby. I'm back on the Charles River side. Finished, completed. I think totally it's about 81 hours. Um, started August 6th at 7.30 in the morning and finished right at 3.30. Um, man, what a journey. Um, I hope that map is right. My brain's a little fried, but the app, the tracking app that I was using is now uploading the journey. So I'll have more information on that. It'll give you some interesting stats and the map of the, uh, of the whole shebang. So I'm excited to see it. Um, and I hope you are too. Thanks for following. Um, really appreciate all the comments and the, uh, you know, the kind words throughout. Um, hope you do something wild like this again. Stay tuned. Right, so there it is. Um, it was muddy. It was covered in spiders, mosquitoes, and poison ivy, but it was an absolute beautiful experience. Um, wildlife from otters to deer, beavers, um, a ton of birds, and the birds were amazing throughout the entire trip. I saw for the first time a black crowned night heron. I didn't know this existed first and foremost. Um, I, it looked like a Pokemon. It was really cool. Um, I saw the invasive water chestnut. Um, I saw um, it's, you know, blooms of cyanobacteria in the lakes and lower basin. Um, but as I'm going along in the Rocky Narrows, I saw boaters, I saw paddle boarders, I saw kids jumping off rope swings like you saw as well. Um, you know, it was August of last year, just to put that in context again. Um, and it occurred to me how much that the river means to the mental health of people and communities alongside it. Like it's a place where you can be outside, where you can be together and you can have a sense of normalcy and peace. Like that translates beyond the um, events of 2020 that carries on um, for as long as we have the Charles River. And so I had a lot of time to think on paddling uh, 80 miles. So I completed the trip 79 hours, 56 minutes, and that's it. There it is. Record set. Done. Right. But why should you care? Right. Like, why should people care about that number? Um, well, I think people should care because it's an important milestone that was unfortunately not included in the river's history yet. It's because care because it's something that could quantify the river, not just as the popular lower basin, the lakes, lakes district, the Bellingham Meadows, or the mud pit that is between 495 and Route 16. It qualifies the whole Charles River as one whole river, one whole river. And it's the only one that we have. It is the one and only. So I'm not a super athlete. Um, I'm not a, nor am I a scientist with like a huge wealth of knowledge on the life cycles of the river, but I have seen the river as one holistic unit. And I've seen and can share the disparity between that success story that is the lower basin over the 30 years and the condition that is currently in the upper river, which is right, the upper river, it's not so much a saleable river, it, but it is a habitat it is an educational experience for people. And it's a resource that should be respected. And it's a signifier of the health of the community at large. Um, and it's my hope that the navigation project shines light on the upper river, um, enough that it can be at least recognized by this community. Um, I very much appreciate all of you for tuning in. Um, I'm, eking up on time um, and I want to have some time for questions, but um, I'm happy to say that moving forward with the help of Audrey and Travis here at Charles River Watershed Association, we're putting together more technical talks for those who, wanting, who are wanting to participate, including um, a series of world breaking, excuse me, um, <laughs> including a series of record breaking runs um, where participants who want to attempt the source to see criteria, they can safely and officially do so. One run, um, if you just can't wait, potentially as soon as this summer for those who want to do it the same way I did and get muddy. Um, and again, the beauty and the health of the Charles River are very important to me, which is why I'm taking this opportunity to spread awareness and also raise funds for the critical work 
that Charles River Watershed Association does to protect and preserve the Charles River. Um, the whole Charles River, front to back, Charles River Watershed Association, Association takes it all, right? So over the next 12 months, I'll be hosting virtual series um, and events touching on those hot topics regarding the health of the Charles and providing tips and tricks on how to complete a successful journey down it. Um, I will also be reaching out to um, businesses and individuals to sponsor the 80 mile competitive journey next spring. This is where I'm hoping to get folks who want to smash the record involved. Um, all of those donations will go towards supporting Charles River Watershed Association's critical work in developing science-based strategies to increase the resilience, protect public health, and promote environmental equity as we confront a rapidly changing climate. Um, so yeah, now if anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to take them on. I think um, the process for this, Travis, what do you say, are they inputting in the in the chat or yeah yeah folks if you have questions for cam we'd love to you just drop it in the chat um we can read them to him and kind of get his get his take uh i know i've got questions so if you guys don't want to jump on that i certainly will yeah some of the more technical aspects i will be covering in some of those um later talks um and we got one on here already uh so this is from jennifer uh jennifer Sulewski. she's curious how many dams did you have to portage around did you have to carry the kayak or did you have wheels I had wheels. That's part of the object support of the criteria. Um, the amount of dams, um, oh, goodness, uh, the, the correct number is escaping me. I want to say it's close to 16 um, of the dams, but the number of portages that you have to do, getting over all of the obstacles and all that, um, especially in the summertime when you can't boat under or boat over, um, it's up in the 70 to 100 range. And I wasn't using wheels for those obstacles, um, just for the portages, just for some of them, actually. Uh, another question here from uh, Sarah Slaughter. Sarah was curious. We saw how low that water level is. She's wondering, would you be able to make it through the tunnels if the water level was higher? No, actually. If the there is a point in early spring where the water level does reach a point, you cannot actually go through. So you would need to use another object support. Um, basically go around 495 because crossing 495 is very unsafe, very unsafe yeah. <laughs> with a boat too. Could you imagine? Um, By most modes of transportation, it's very unsafe. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, there is a point. And like, um, like I had stated before, there was somebody who had gone well, who um, recently took it on. He just barely made it underneath. Um, so it's a good thing that he did some, he did some research beforehand to know what was available or else, you know, again, it's, it's kind of trip over at that point. Gotcha. Another question here, uh, from R. Simmons, what's interesting thing says, do you think increased traffic in the upper river will hurt the environments and habitats of animals and plants? How can we experience beauty of the river without leaving our mark? I guess wondering, you know, if, if taking to the river and doing this trek is counterintuitive and might, might disturb the environment. Um, you know, I don't think that this trek is for everybody. Um, you know, I think that the upper river can be for everybody. I think that there's plenty of opportunities to go and enjoy it and respect it. Um, that there is a huge increase in, in traffic there. I honestly, I don't see, um, it, it could very well happen. And I think that everybody who is going to visit the part, any part of the river should approach it with a level of respect. Um, and that goes for wildlife, for um, packing out what you pack, what you carry in, um, all of that stuff. You can take these precautions and still utilize a resource and not um, destroy it. And that essentially is the kind of awareness and education that needs to be provided to people that, you know, places like um, Charles River Watershed Association can take on. So. Absolutely. I agree all along the way. Um, this one, I think everybody's wondering deep down uh, from Maggie Wilson. Did you ever find the river otters? Did you, you know, did you ever I saw some, them? yeah, I saw some, but you know, they're like, they're out of water for a second and then they dip <laughs> down. So far too fast for me to capture on camera, unfortunately. I do want to take my like professional rig out and just do like a, like a, get some proper shots of the river otters, but um, cause they're so darn cute. <laughs> um, we can so. all agree on that point, I think. 
uh, from Tom McLeod. Um, what one principal recommendation would you make to anyone contemplating this journey? Do your research, for sure. Um, do your research, check the existing conditions of the river. Because if you're planning this trip and um, there's either too much water, like we discussed with the 495 bridge, or there's too little water and you're not physically able to make that trip, um, dragging a canoe so far, um, those are both game changers. You know, my earlier story um, of going in a canoe and, and destroying that canoe um, is, you know, just lack of preparation. So um, definitely do your research, go a couple of days before and see what the actual conditions are, not just, you know, um, hey, it rained two days ago, I should be good. But just, you know, if you're going to do area zero, definitely, definitely do a little field work beforehand. This is a good one here from Sarah Slaughter. Does CRWA, EPA, or U.S. Geological Service or someone else do water monitoring in those upper reaches of the Charles? Um, we do have a water monitoring flagging program that we uh, collect regular samples and determine if the water is, is, is deemed safe for, for boating activity based upon cyanobacteria levels and things of that nature. Um, I can, I will drop the website for our flagging program here, which we recommend folks check if they plan to be out in the water, if they're going to be recreating as Cam did, um, you know, because you need cyanobacteria is, it's that's something you want to get involved in. If you have pets, if you have small children, you want to keep them away as far as possible. Um, so good to be aware and folks are monitoring those areas and making sure the information is out there and available. Yeah. Oh, also, before I get another question, I just want to apologize for my pronunciation. And during the video, uh, there were a couple, um, a couple misses on the Quinabaquin and uh, cyanobacteria on there. I chalk it up to just being extremely tired. <laughs> I think you're allowed that. Yeah. Uh, let's see, it's from William Goodwin. I live along the river in Medway and it's generally navigable and full of wildlife. Uh, yeah. You picked a tough time of year, he says. Yeah, great uh, yeah. uh, a question, how many beaver dams did you encounter? Around here, there are loads of beavers. Oh my goodness. Um, it's hard to tell. Um, there are essentially, there's again, 70 to 100 different obstructions that are in um, that upper area of the river. Hard to tell sometimes if they are beaver dams or not. Um, I want to say at least at least five, five to 10. Um, and it's, I mean, you can really tell when they're around because they have that very cartoonish kind of, um, you know, cut on the wood. It looks like very huge. Um, and uh, you see them knock down a couple of branches, but, you know, just like the otters, you see them for an instant and then they're gone, so. Uh, and a similar note here from Angelica Evans, uh, should we get volunteers to get the tree obstructions out? Um, I don't know. What do you think, Travis? I, I think that it's part of, it's a natural part of the river. Um, yeah, that's generally something that I think we would, we would um, caution against, you know, one for that principle you mentioned where, you know, you want to disturb as little as possible and leave it the way it is. I mean, certainly some of that may be natural, some of that may not be natural, um, but it's, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes, as Cam mentioned, and the folks best able to handle that would be um, contact EPA, DEP, um, folks who are, you know, monitoring this regularly and can, can kind of handle this with um, the best information available. Yeah. Um, let's see here from Peter Doherty. Uh, are sections of the upper river accessible on foot, such as the ones, uh, such as that one could do a clean up event there? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, such as that one could do a clean up event there without boats. So first, let's know if it, a cleanup event could take place there. Is it, can you, yeah. Um, so there, I, I, it's hard to tell. I'm not sure exactly what area you're referring to. I think it was around the Lakes District. So um, without a boat, I think, yeah, arranging with Charles River Watershed Association, they would find a way to get you all there um, during a cleanup event. Is that the, am I answering that correctly? Yeah, well, this, a person may be referring to, uh, we do an annual Charles River uh, Earth Day cleanup, um, and they might be wondering if there's parts up there that can be gotten to on foot that could be, folks could clean up if they, if they wanted to. Got it, yeah. Um, let's see here, from Melissa Duncan, this is a good one here. Uh, since you mentioned early on in one of your videos that one of your motivations for this trip was to learn more about yourself. Did you find that was true? Um, any takeaways you would like to share with us on how this sort of experience can affect the adventure? Um, get you on the therapist couch. Oh yeah, Melissa, well, thank you. Um, okay, so I learned that I would I would probably do it again. Um, <laughs> I think you know a challenge is always good for me, and I feel like um, 
getting through this one in particular, because I had such a um, tumultuous first go at it and having that victory, um, I think like really, really set me up in a happy place and makes me want to get out and do more challenges. So I definitely learned that, you know, um, resilience, but also with, you know, a little bit of research goes a long way. Um, that's all I got for that. Unless we want to go like, you know, back to childhood. And... Yeah. Tell us about your mother. Ken. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's on here. Actually. She could tell you about oh, it. Yeah. Self <laughs> Thank you for joining us this evening. If you have a question for Ken, you can go ask him. <laughs> Uh, let's see from uh, Mark Alito. Uh, apologies, Cameron, better late than never. Hoping copy presentation will be sent out by the way uh, Ella Bean offers guided short trips out in the river of dead in the rec center. Um, yeah, good thing to mention. This will be recorded as being recorded. Uh, we'll be putting it on our website in our past virtual events section. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was such a big list of folks who wanted to watch this. We'll probably be emailing it out as well. So anybody who registered will get this and you can, you can watch it at your leisure. Uh, another one from Sarah Slaughter. Sarah, how easy is it for other people to get out in the river for short or long trips? Oh, it's super easy. Um, so reach out to either um, for recreational events, you can reach out to either Paddle Boston or Charles River Watershed Association. They will point you in the right direction. Paddle Boston's an easy go. Um, they provide boats. They provide plans for folks, um, you know, on different sections of the river. They're easily accessible. They're um, they're on the internet, um, just like everything else. And yes, Paddle Boston would probably be the, the reference I would go to. If you're interested in, you know, just having a walk next to the river, um, then you could, it's either from the Esplanade or the Charles River walking trail runs all the way along the Charles River. So um, fairly easy. Um, and it doesn't have to be like trudging through mud and all that stuff either. You could go out for a very nice and um, even luxurious paddle. I've like. got one for you, Cam. Was there ever a moment when you were out there where you, were you obviously not the first attempt, the first attempt is a little bit separate, but that second time where you were out there and you thought, was this such a good idea? I was watching your video, one of the points where you were trekking <laughs> through the mud with your high waters on, you, you know, you're referring to it as, as, as Siberian style mud, um, yeah. you know, and you really couldn't see the water. Like, I, had that been me, I would have thought to myself, I kind of want to go home. Was this the best idea? What was I thinking? Did that ever happen? You know, for the second round, no, because I, I feel like um, I was fortunate enough to, you know, have Steve with me the first time to go through that the first time, because that first time, definitely, we were in the middle of Milford Pond. And we were like, is did we like, we're in the middle of this pond now, how are like, we have to go the rest of the way. And it was a real like, some real um, feelings about turning back and just calling it quits after that. But um but having gotten through that, right, and being resilient with the research and all that, um, you know, the second round was fun. Gotcha. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, you know, one thing that really caught me was seeing um, you found a tire, and then shortly after you found a horseshoe. That was presumably from, you know, so, so you found a historical timeline of people taking the transportation <laughs> leftovers and throwing it in the river, um, yeah. which kind of just shows the narrative. You know, it, it, the story's always been the same with the Charles. Um, you know, we needed to survive, but we don't always think about it when life gets fast and complicated. Yeah, I mean, um, it really is, it's a remarkable, um, it's a remarkable place from front to back. Um, so I guess I can, we're getting up on eight o'clock now. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd just like to leave you with another last story. Um, so, Two weeks ago now, um, Steve and I finished the remaining 60 miles of our original navigation. And we were portaging our kayaks across Moody Street in Waltham. So we're taking these two boats right across the street. And two kids, maybe 10 or 12 years old, uh, come up to us on scooters. Like, hey, man, where are you going? Right? And like, what on earth are you doing with these boats? Like their little minds were blown. And this is Waltham, right? Where the river is substantial and it's got a healthy flow to the big waterfall there. Um, and we told them where we had come from and it may as well have been Mars, right? But it's like, it's not Mars, it's their backyard, right? And the Charles River is essentially the, in the backyard of everyone in the watershed. Um, it's the one and it's the only Charles River that we have. And from the source 
all the way to the Atlantic. And when there's that holistic awareness to it, the community at large will be better off for it. So with that, um, I just want to say thanks again to Charles River Watershed Association, to Paddle Boston for making this happen. Thanks everyone who's listening on this Thursday evening. And um, please keep in touch with Charles River Watershed Association and its community for more exciting updates, more fun. Wonderful. God, thank you so much, Ken. Thank you everyone who attended today. Uh, as mentioned, we'll be sharing this out on our website and you can watch any time. And there will be more of these uh, as we build up to your uh, chance to kind of recreate Cam's journey. And um, you know, we'll have short videos and kind of other sessions where we can discuss more specific parts of Cam's journey from everything from diet planning out in the river to, to what to pack to everything else. So um, thank you for joining us and have a great Thursday. Bye, everybody. Thanks again.